This podcast is brought to you by Progressive. Most of you aren't just listening right now. You're driving, cleaning, and even exercising. But what if you could be saving money by switching to Progressive? Drivers who save by switching save nearly $750 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Multitask right now. Quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customer surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. At Bet365, we don't do ordinary. We believe that every sport should be epic. Every home run, every hit, every inning, every play. From the moments that are legendary to the ones that fly under the radar. Whether it's a walk-off, grand slam, or a base hit to center field. Whatever the sport, whatever the moment. It's never ordinary at Bet365. 21 plus only must be physically located in Virginia. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. The following podcast includes explicit language, including, well, you'll just have to wait and see. Hi, I'm Stefan Fatsis, and this is Slate's Sports Podcast. Hang up and listen for the week of April 1st, 2024. On this week's show, we'll talk about NCAA basketball. As we record this on Monday morning, South Carolina and North Carolina State have qualified for the Women's Final Four. Lindsay Schnell of USA Today will be here to discuss that tournament. On the men's side, Connecticut, Alabama, Purdue, and North Carolina State are in. Eamon Brennan, who writes the College Hoops newsletter Buzzer, will join us. Finally, we'll talk to Kent Babb of the Washington Post about his profile of LSU women's basketball coach Kim Mulkey, which, in case you hadn't heard, was published over the weekend. I'm in Washington, D.C., and I'm the author of the book's Word Freak, A Few Seconds of Panic and Wild and Outside, and it's my birthday. No joke. Yay. Josh Levine is off this week. He'll be hosting a new slow burn for Slate about the rise of Fox News. Can't wait for that. Joel Anderson is not off. He writes the emotional investment column for Slate and is the host of three seasons of Slow Burn, the most recent of which, Becoming Justice Thomas, last week won the podcast equivalent of Best Picture Oscar, the Ambies Award for Podcast of the Year. Loved seeing Joel on stage accepting the trophy from RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars winner, Trixie Mattel. Let's listen. Thank you um, to the Academy. I did prepare a speech because uh, I thought maybe I had a chance in the other category, not this one. So <laughs> I won't need my whole 60 uh, seconds. Um, but first of all, thanks to the Academy. Um, this has been just a fantastic show. Thanks to the many fans and supporters of the podcast, um, especially the people that subscribe to Slate Plus. We can't do work without money and people that care about the work that we do. So. Um, <laughs> You know, it's really helpful to, to be able to go places like show up in Savannah, Georgia at Justice Thomas's mother's house. You know what I'm saying? We do that with the money we make through Slate Plus. Um, and uh, I, I stand here today, you know, representing a lot of people um, and a lot of great work, but here are some of them that are not here tonight. But um, Derek John, Josh Levine, my boy, my dog, man. Mm-hmm. First, you got to say thanks to the Academy. I mean, yeah. you might as well retire, right? <laughs> Second, you got to call Josh your dog. So Josh actually won the biggest award of the evening right there. Now, seriously, Joel, amazing work. The recognition is more than deserved. Everyone should go back and listen to Becoming Justice Thomas. It is journalism that matters. Congratulations, my friend. Well, thanks, Stefan. Yeah, and um, there's a lot to respond to there. First of all, happy birthday. I assume it's like, what, 47? Something like that. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stefan looks good, as always, at any age. But yeah, no, man, um, it's pretty surreal to be able to do something like that. And, you know, the reason I'm always so complimentary of Josh, that Josh will always have my defense, is that Josh is the guy that brought me to slate. He's the guy that said, hey, man, you want to come over here and do some cool stuff? He always advocated for me and pushed for me. And uh, none of this happens without Josh. Uh, and you could say that for the whole Slow Burn franchise itself. He, like, he is the secret ingredient. He's been involved in every season 
of that show. So it's a victory for him as well. And for the whole Slow Burn 18, man. So I was really excited. And yeah, man, thanks so much. You know, my dad watched it and he said, man, I just can't believe my son was on stage, you know, you know, accepting an award. And uh, so that was just kind of cool, too, you know, to, to, to do something like that. So uh, I hope I get a second chance at it so I can be a little more prepared. But you know, in the interim, it was pretty cool. I don't do it for awards, but uh, it's it's nice to win every now and again. Well, you weren't the only person bringing home some hardware for H-Town, Joel, last week. I was off the show last week because I was running the annual North American School Scrabble Championship at uh, Planet Word. It's an amazing museum in D.C. More than 100 kids, grades 3 to 12, awesome live stream. should go back and watch. High-level play. Here's some of the bingos. Cryptid, suasive, pharynx, oxtails, idolatry. Kids were amazing. The winner of the high school division, Joel, was 12th grader Cherish Ambiocolo of Houston. Took down one of my D.C. kids, 10th grader Gideon Brusowski, in a one-game final. Let's give it up for Cherish. She was born in Nigeria, moved to Houston at age six. She's heading to Wash U in St. Louis to study neuroscience. So good week for Houston, unless you're an Astros fan, Joel, or a Cougars fan. Or you want to endlessly relive Houston losing to North Carolina State in 1983. You got to take the bad with the good, my dog. Well, the one thing about the Yankees fans on this show, I was like, well, I, I would say I'd see you all in October, but we all know better than that. So we should just play that Joel clip every week as our pitch for you to join <laughs> Slate Plus. But I am contractually obligated to add that Slate Plus members make this show possible. As Josh said last week, we're doing something different with the segments formerly known as bonus segments. No new name yet, but the new format means that the bonus will appear in your feed as a separate episode with its own episode description. We're going to record this week's bonus episode after the Iowa LSU Elite Eight game on Monday night special emergency breaking news bonus episode. If you want to hear that and you don't subscribe, there are two ways for you to get the whole hang up and listen experience every week. You can either subscribe right now by going to Apple podcasts and clicking try free at the top of our show page, or you can visit slate.com slash hang up plus to get access wherever you listen. Saturday's marquee for the women's sweet 16 look like this. Caitlin Clark in Iowa, then Juju Watkins in USC, then Angel Reese in LSU, then Paige Beckers in UConn. The name recognition was emblematic of a new truth about college hoops. The women's game has more appointment viewing players, personalities, and storylines than the men's. Those four teams all won and will play their Elite Eight games on Monday night after we record this part of the show, UConn, USC, and the highly anticipated 2023 finals rematch, LSU, Iowa. But there's plenty for us to discuss now, and here to do that is USA Today Enterprise sports reporter Lindsay Schnell, who's in Portland, Oregon, covering the western side of the bracket. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a beautiful day in my city. But I've only been in a gym the last week, so I didn't. I was unaware that there was sunshine outside. <laughs> All right, so LSU and Clark have sucked up so much oxygen that it's easy to forget that South Carolina is, you know, thirty six and zero. The Gamecocks were tested by Indiana in the Sweet Sixteen, winning by just four, and by Oregon State for a while in the Elite Eight. They'll play North Carolina State in the Final Four. Any reason to believe, Lindsay, that despite? all of the other noise, they're still not the team to beat? I definitely think they are the team to beat. I keep wondering, are they going to win it all? I was so convinced last year that they were going to not just beat Iowa, but roll over Iowa in the national semifinals. It wasn't until the game was had been over for five minutes and I was like, Oh, so I guess South Carolina isn't winning the title this year. So I am hesitant to be as all in on them as I was last year. And I do think that they've been pushed this year a few times. Now the question is, can NC State push them? Man, NC State's guards have looked really, really good um, in the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight. Can they replicate that performance? I don't know. I think that a big advantage South Carolina has is they've been on this stage before. They won't be, you know, blinded by the lights and everything because there's a lot of hoopla at the Final Four that has nothing to do with the basketball. But I, I definitely, I mean, they're undefeated and few people have come close and you can argue that there are a couple times that they should have lost. 
mostly to Tennessee in the SEC semifinals of that conference tournament. But I don't know, man. They just keep figuring out a way to win. And to their credit, every time someone gets close, they hit a big shot. They do what a championship team is supposed to do. So is it that, that they're because they're more of an ensemble cast that you have a little more doubt about? Because it's not like, you know, all these other teams, there's Juju, there's Caitlin, there's whatever, right? And this is like, you know, I guess probably the most prominent player is Cardoso, right, for, yeah. for South Cardoso, Carolina. So it's yeah. not like there's the Aaliyah Boston of the past years, right? And so I guess is that is that what you're, when you have that doubt, it's like they don't have that one person, go get me a bucket. And exactly. Close it out. I, I was saying that, you know, like to your point with Juju, with Paige, with Caitlin, when those teams are not playing well and they call a timeout, okay, we're running a play for this player to get them the ball in space and let them do their thing. So there's an argument to be made that a lot of people for South Carolina could do that, but also do they have someone that's super dependable? Um, and then it's also different because the person you think of is Cardozo. And when you need to get a bucket, a lot of times you need a playmaker. So someone else has to make a play to get her the ball in the paint. And she can't be in foul trouble, obviously. She needs to be on the floor. So I think that that's why like their balance is their greatest strength for sure and their depth. But I'm just, yeah, I'm just like, okay, who are they running a play to? Now, they would argue and say Raven Johnson, you know, a year after being literally waved off by Caitlin Clark as I don't need to guard you. She has knocked down huge buckets. But it's interesting, the deeper we've gone into the tournament, the more people have said, like in the press room as we're watching games, like, oh, man, I just don't know if they can win it all. But I wonder if we're all just scarred from last year and what happened. And Lindsay, you said you were in the gym, so you got to see a team that, you know, everybody could have reasonably expected South Carolina to be there. North Carolina State, not so much. Uh, and they knocked off, you know, top seed of Texas uh, this weekend, and you were in the game. I mean, obviously, it was a surprise that NC State was there, but what did they do to knock off Texas? Oh, my gosh. Well, uh, you know, what I wrote was I don't think it would have mattered where the three-point line was uh, Sunday night. Isaiah James would have just hit it no matter what. It, she probably could have walked into the gym and started shooting. What's incredible is she had these, like, a 40-minute stretch that was just mind-blowing, right, because she scored... 25 in the second half against Stanford and then against Texas she had 21 the first half I think it was that's wild you know she is just mm -hmm. on one and I did appreciate what Shay Holly from Texas who guarded her most of the game said she goes I don't like when you say someone's unconscious because she said she's a good player and she's capable of this she did what you're supposed to do NC State's guards when they beat Stanford in the Sweet 16 at the end of the third quarter. Saniya James took Stanford off the dribble and, I mean, it looked like an and one mixtape because of how superior she was to her defender and her ability to get to the rim and then her elevation and this incredible shot. And I asked her after the game, I, you know, I was kind of waiting for you to do that all game. Was there a point when you remembered like, oh, yeah, I'm much more athletic than everyone else. I can do this. <laughs> and she laughed and said that, you know, they definitely felt that, had that confidence. And so I think that carried over to Texas. And they just blitzed them, you know, early in the first half. And Texas, I the because I'm a West Coast girl, the comparison I always make is Stanford football under David Shaw. You know, so Texas is down 15 points. I said to the person next to me, this is like Stanford football. They can't score really quickly. That's not what their offense is. So if you can get them in a big hole, it is going to be hard for them to catch up. And that's exactly what happened. But then, you know, they go inside. NC State pounds the ball inside to River Baldwin. She had 16 points in second half, 12 in the third quarter. Like that is a talk about balance. You know, their guards just did sliced and dice Texas's defense, a, a very vaunted defense, you know, Vic Schaefer, the Texas coach, his nickname is the Secretary of Defense. We think he might have given himself that nickname. It's unclear, <laughs> but still, you know, and then you go inside and she goes to work in the paint. Can they play with South Carolina? I think so. I mean, I don't know. Again, they, they haven't been on that stage, but it was, I just thought their guard play was incredible. You said that it wouldn't matter where the three-point line was, and you were referring to what happened before um, the Texas-North Carolina State game on Sunday, where a fan apparently noticed and took photos of the 
three-point lines and because he thought that one was shorter than the other, and it turned out that it was. And there's this video of like the coaches stepping off with their shoes to try to measure the distance at the three-point line, and then they bring out a tape measure. And in fact, there were several inches difference. I mean, Vic Schaefer, the Texas coach, said after the game, well, I hate to say this, but I have a lot of colleagues that would say only in women's basketball. How does this even happen? The NCAA threw the company that makes the floors under the bus, but where's your quality control and why do these kinds of things keep happening despite all of the attention and all of the criticism that the NCAA has faced in recent years about how they treat women's sports? Yeah, I'm... I'm so confused about this whole thing, how how it happened. So it's important to note that the floors are produced off-site. And the NCAA, they bring in new floors. They rebuild the court at every NCAA site. You're not just sticking some decals on. What's strange is that the, the women's college three-point line and the men's college three-point line are the same distance, which is 22 feet, one and three quarters of an inch. That is also the FIBA international three-point line. So on a college campus, most gyms just have one three-point line. The high school line is 19 feet, 9 inches. So what I don't understand is the difference looks pretty big. They wouldn't let the media on the floor to measure ourselves. A few of us went and found tape measures, you know, because we were going to do it ourselves and figure out exactly what the distance was. They wouldn't let us do that. But when you look at it, now that it's been pointed out, the difference looks significant. So what I'm confused by is, well, they had, I would assume that wherever they make the floors, they just keep like a list. Okay, we're making a floor for X. This is what the measurement should be. But what is the measurement that they used? Because neither of them are an NBA line. We would have known that. Neither of them are a high school line. So yeah, how does this keep happening? How did we, how did all of us, I mean, I've, I've wondered this about myself. How didn't I notice this? All I do is watch women's basketball. Why didn't I see the difference? Um, why didn't the coaches see the difference? But also, you know, it's not the coach's job. Like, to your question, where is the quality control? Who's doing this? And then we found out yesterday, so they they talked to the coaches and, do you want to delay this? You know, but it would take an hour, at least an hour, for someone to come in and fix it. Well, afterward, we we were all talking to people who make floors, and they said, oh, it would have taken much longer than an hour. You can't come in and repaint that. So supposedly, when we go to the gym today... The correct three-point line is probably going to be taped down. So welcome to the Elite Eight. Wow. wow. I'm curious to see if that actually did happen. I, I wondered, too, could they, like, could they ship a floor overnight, you know, uh, up? Like, there's got to be another floor somewhere with the correct dimensions. Lindsay, in a Los Angeles Time column that described the players as dirty debutantes this weekend, Moki obviously responded. A lot of other LSU players responded. And I'm just sort of curious like, what your thoughts were about the coverage of LSU in general and in that column in particular. Well, first of all, I think that column was disgusting and never should have been published. It's unbelievable to me that multiple editors, assumingly, read it and okayed it. It was blatantly racist and sexist. I thought my colleague Nancy Armour said, you know, it wasn't a dog whistle so much as a a blaring bullhorn. And that was accurate. Uh, she and I were texting the other day and she said he might as well have just used the actual slurs. You know, that's what he was trying to say. I had said to someone a couple weeks ago, you know, I'm so glad that we have so many more eyeballs on the women's game now and there's so much more attention. But man, we got some men out there with bad takes. <laughs> like these people <laughs> that have only ever covered men's college basketball that are coming in. But um, I just think it was like horrifically inappropriate. What's crazy is that a lot of us didn't know about it until Kim went off about it. And so when Kim Mulkey said, you know, Google dirty debutantes, we're in the press room in Portland doing it. So if you do it, porn comes up. Like, of course she was. Oh I, my gosh. Yeah, of co- right. I didn't know that. Like, you know, I was mortified. Um, I didn't blame her for being furious. Here's the thing. LSU likes being the villain. And the Angel mm-hmm. Reese has talked about that. And she knows that. She relishes in it. You know, she's tough. She likes that people doubt her. And then I think that Kim Mulkey, most of us understand that the world, we see the world in shades of gray. We understand people are complex. I don't think that that's how Kim Mulkey sees the world. It's black or white. You are friend or foe, with her or against her. 
So she inspires those types of reactions. So then her team inspires those types of reactions. I love LSU. Flaugé Johnson is one of my favorite players in the country. I don't know that there's someone who plays with more joy on the floor. Angel Reese is so tough inside. Michaela Williams, their stud freshman, is awesome. Anissa Morrow, a transfer from DePaul, has been one of the most impactful transfers of the year. And Kim is crazy. I I think everyone knows that, and I don't think Kim would deny that. But she's got seven national championships, so it's working for her. But yeah, I think that it's just, it's lazy to go with the villain trope when you don't really understand the full picture of it. Because I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people in the Big Ten who think Caitlin Clark is a villain, who are not fans of Caitlin Clark. I think my, my, I think my favorite thing over the weekend, though, Joel, was uh, during Angel Reese's press conference on Sunday, someone asked her about whether she and Caitlin Clark were the equivalent of Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. And she said, people do compare that matchup all the time, but I've never seen the matchup, so I'm not really familiar with it. <laughs> Come on. I mean, I also, that's also, just incredible. I think that's just incredible. I, yeah, I mean, man, that was how many years ago? I mean, you know what I mean? That would have been like asking me if I'd watched, you know, Oscar Robinson in University of Cincinnati or something, you know what I mean, when I was kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The one thing, though, that I'm, uh, I mean, that's a very favorable comparison for Angel Reese. I mean, that she gets to be magic. I mean, that's, I mean, she's a good basketball player, but <laughs> the Magic Johnson comparison is a little much, I feel like, but that, that's okay. That's all right. And for all the concerns that there are about, like, the Caitlin Clark going off to the WNBA and leaving women's college basketball without stars, it seems to me, like, particularly in this USC-UConn game, I mean, we've got Paige Beckers and Juju Watkins. Seems like the game's in pretty good hands. These are really good basketball players, stars that have, you know, uh, celebrity potential, right? Oh, 1,000%. I mean, haven't you seen the Juju Watkins commercial with her bun and Joel Embiid? Like... I love Juju. I love her game. I love her as a person. Um, same with Paige. You know, it's kind of crazy, right? Because two years ago when Paige was a freshman, she was the talk. And remember, they matched up with Iowa in the tournament and UConn won handily. Paige was the one that won AP Player of the Year, all this stuff. I think that more and more women, young women are deciding, you know what, I want to go to a school that either hasn't done it before or hasn't done it in a long time. And I want to see if I can pull them back to prominence. That's what Juju did in deciding to go to SC. I mean, SC has not been a powerhouse since the 80s under Cheryl Miller. Obviously, Paige went to UConn, which is a powerhouse. But still, you know, they have they have struggled the last few years in their world. Like, they have a different bar than everyone else. And Paige has just been bullish on I'm not leaving and I'm going to fix it. We're going to get back to the final four. One of the coaches made a reference the other day to all the different freshmen across the country. I mean, Hannah Hidalgo at Notre Dame. I love her game. Um, someone brought a, uh, someone brought up the freshman at Fairfield and I was like, I don't know who that is. I need to go look this girl up. Like how great <laughs> is that? What I am really happy about as an Oregon State alum, I'm devastated about the Pac-12, but The good thing about the Pac-12 network going up in flames is that now people will be able to see all these kids. I mean, when Juju dropped 51 on Stanford, no one saw that game. I saw that game, but no one else saw that game. And Haley Van Lith talked about this. She said when she was growing up, she would turn on the TV and it was always men. She's like, you know, I, I was looking up to Kyrie and Steph. And she said, now little girls turn on the TV and they see us. That matters. And it's People are going to fall in love with players that we're not even thinking about or talking about yet. And that's how we know the game is growing. Lindsay Schnell is a sports enterprise reporter for USA Today. She's covering the women's basketball tournament in Portland, Oregon. Lindsay, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yes, of course. Thank you for having me. Next up, Eamon Brennan of Buzzer on the men's tournament. Apple Card is the perfect cash back rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase, every day. That's 3% on your favorite products at Apple, 2% on all other Apple Card with Apple Pay purchases, 
and 1% on anything you buy with your titanium Apple Card or virtual card number. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City Branch. Subject to credit approval. Terms apply. Apple Card is the perfect cash back rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase, every day. That's 3% on your favorite products at Apple, 2% on all other Apple Card with Apple Pay purchases, and 1% on anything you buy with your titanium Apple Card or virtual card number. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City Branch. Subject to credit approval. Terms apply. And it's over. This is what dreams are made of. An unlikely run to the Final Four for NC State. Echoes of 1983. And the cardiac pack. When 11th seeded North Carolina State closed out its 12-point win over in-state arch-rival Duke on Sunday, the Wolfpack became the fourth and final team to clinch a spot in the Final Four. That means the men's semifinals in Phoenix on Saturday will start with NC State versus top-seeded Purdue. Then reigning national champ and one-seed Connecticut will face Alabama, a number four seed in the later primetime matchup. To break it all down and look ahead to the weekend, we've brought on Eamon Brennan, a longtime college basketball writer formerly of ESPN and The Athletic, who now runs his own newsletter titled Buzzer at Eamon. And I'm going to spell it out so people know to go to it. It's E-A-M-O-N-N. B-R-E-N-N-A-N dot com. I got that, I think. Eamon, welcome to the show. Thank you, and thank you for the accurate uh, URL spelling. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, it, help, it helps. Every little bit helps, right? But um, let's start with the most improbable team that's still standing, North Carolina State. So 20 days ago, the Wolfpack was losing to seven-win Louisville in the 10-15 game of the ACC tournament. Now they've won nine straight games to advance to the Final Four. What the hell happened? Yeah, it's it's first of all, March happened. I think we have some of this almost every year, whether it's, you know, FAU last year or your talented but underachieving high major team a la NC State that gets hot at the right time. And sometimes you can explain it. Sometimes you can't. I think with with NC State, they figured some stuff out um, late in the year, even though they were losing those games. Their coaches now, you know, they lost four of uh, they lost their last four games and I think seven of their last nine, something like that. Um and coaches now, and maybe this is hindsight, uh, will will say that they were fundamentally optimistic um, based on how they were playing, even as their season was kind of fading away, because they were playing better defense, getting some more stops, and, and just maybe not making as many shots as you've seen in this tournament. But, you know, they very could have easily lost to Louisville in the first round of the ACC tournament. Um, they could have easily lost to Virginia and probably should have. In the ACC tournament semifinals, Virginia had a chance to to basically ice the game at the free throw line, missed, and then NC State hit a three late. And so they've had a little bit of magic just to get to the tournament in the first place. But, you know, since they've been here, they've been great. And and as everybody has come to, to discover and understand, I think even a lot of college basketball fans who maybe dismissed him for most of the year and for a lot of his career, DJ Burns is a is an absolute stud. And he's a combination of, of massive size and personality and touch that you don't see all that often in college hoops. And he is playing the absolute best basketball of his life on the biggest stage. It sounds like the DJ Burns story really is the one that turned this team around. Early in the season, he was viewed by teammates and coaches as being out of shape. They put him on a conditioning plan. Um, this is a guy that the grad transfer uh, was the Big South player of the year at Winthrop last year, but he wasn't doing it at NC State, and it looked like things were getting away from him. You know, he's 6'9", 275. You put on an extra 10 or 15 – you are not doing what you need to do. Um, but they managed to turn his season around, it sounds like. I mean, he, he was, um, he's been amazing in this tournament. He's like the NCAA tournament mascot, for one thing, but he's also been absolutely dominant. He had 29 on 13 for 19 on Sunday in NC State's Elite Eight win. Yeah, you know, he is a, he's a really interesting guy. I think uh, he started his career at Tennessee, and Tennessee under Rick Barnes, you know, as, as people would have seen against in the game against Purdue, extremely physical program, um, extremely high emphasis on conditioning and strength and conditioning. And so I think Tennessee saw him as a as a really talented high school guy with obviously the touch that you see um, with his left hand and sort of his passing feel and thought, 
look, we're going to get this kid in shape the way we get everybody in shape and he's going to be incredible. And it just didn't happen. And he transferred to Winthrop and, you know, Winthrop's a good program, but mid-major level, if you're talented, maybe you don't have to to do the the strength and conditioning stuff. You know, you can kind of get by. And yeah, that you know, the beginning of the season, he came in and he was, uh, he talked a lot about his, his conditioning plan. And um, it's kind of the baseball training camp joke with him of, of every year, some guy comes in, in the best shape of his life and he retooled his hitting routine or whatever. And DJ Burns did that in the off season and, and came back and was basically <laughs> looked the same to me. Like I didn't really notice a ton of difference, <laughs> but if you can keep him on the floor, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't have to be an Adonis, just keep him on the floor. You can see what he can do with his body. And in fact, he's good because of his body, not in spite of it. You, you put that feel and touch um, in that frame and he gives guys like Kyle Filipowski from Duke, who's going to be an NBA player probably for a long time, um, a really difficult challenge defensively. And, and yeah, like you mix that with his passing, um, the way he's able to spread the floor and, and um, keep everything ticking over. He's been spectacular and he's, he's the main reason NC State is where it is. So NC State is a team where all of the players who earned minutes in the regional final transferred into the program, right? Like, I'm just sort of wondering, because people have talked a lot about the changes that have taken over college sports, right? Do you think that that has helped them at all? Or do you think that was part of the reason, you know, that that change, this sort of transfer culture is the reason that it took them a while to pick up and sort of get some gain some chemistry and pick things up together? Yeah, I mean, that's probably part of it. I think I think the coaching staff would probably say that's the case. I think it's tough because there are also lots of examples of of teams that have plenty of transfers and the coaches are are able to synthesize them really quickly as early as the summer fall um, and by the time they get to November December they look not like the finished article but like they're viable really good teams that have sort of figured themselves out in college basketball you kind of have to do that not not just incorporate transfers which everybody's doing to, to varying degrees but you kind of have to figure it out early because the way schedules are are structured NC State played BYU, Ole Miss, Tennessee in the non-conference, and that's pretty much it, right? You know, they have a bunch of games against teams you should beat, and then you have two or three, four, depending on your schedule, really important non-conference games. You lose those, and you're just sort of average in conference play. Um, your odds of making the NCAA tournament are, are, are pretty minimal, and obviously NC State had to win the ACC tournament and win five games in the ACC tournament to get here. So it has totally reshaped college basketball, the, the availability of transfers immediately. Some coaches are... are you know, doing a great job getting guys on campus and making them work as a team right away. Other places need a little bit more time. And other other programs you see take a much more circumspect approach to transfers, maybe add a guy or two here and there, but don't want to remake their rosters every year. Um, it has made this sort of thing more possible, I think. And it has also made quick rebuilds much more possible. So it's interesting on a year-to-year basis. You, you, if you're a fan, you don't necessarily have to wait two or three years for your team to get good. But um, there are perils that come with it as well. So shifting to the team that they're going to play uh, in the semifinal on Saturday is Purdue. And this is a year after they were the only the second number one seed to lose uh, in the expanded era of the NCAA tournament. Obviously, this didn't come easy for Purdue, but how do you think it was that they were able to sort of shake off the, I mean, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a, a tremendous embarrassment for any program to lose under those circumstances the way that they did. How did they shake that off and get back to this point? And they also lost as a two to a 15, right? Before that. Yeah. Purdue has a long and, and storied history, um, particularly in the last few years of, of losing games in the tournament that it shouldn't lose. You know, they lost to St. Peter's um, in the Sweet 16 two years ago, which you know, frankly, it was probably, you know, all due respect to the Peacocks, that that was probably a worse performance than what happened against Fairleigh Dickinson last year. Guys absolutely horrified at the the notion that they might lose as early as the first half. And you could just, you know, Matt Painter didn't adjust and he's talked about it a lot. I think their sort of recent tournament history is a thing that for a long time, if you were Matt Painter and, and I think most college basketball fans um, who are smart and watch the tournament every year and, and see teams wax and wane and see Virginia lose to a 16 and win it the next year and see Villanova get knocked out over and over and over again and then win two national titles in four years. Um, there's always these narratives uh, from the broader public about guys that can't win in March, and I typically dismiss them, and I think rightfully so. But I think what's interesting about Matt Painter is is this offseason particularly – he talked a lot about how he wasn't dismissing that maybe and 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 that it maybe wasn't quite so random and he, maybe he wasn't doing a good enough job and he needed to really do a self-examination of him and his team, his program. Um, what can he 
do differently to avoid this kind of annual embarrassment um, from a program that should be competing for national titles, given its talent level and what it's achieved in the regular season. And I think that level of self-reflection is is pretty admirable. And, and what came out of it for Purdue was a sort of consistency with who they are and what they did last year and what they were good at with the acknowledgement that they couldn't just run it back and be stubborn. They had to add pieces. They had to add Lance Jones, you know, a transfer who had gave them much more pop on the perimeter, which was one of their big issues all year last year with two young freshman guards who weren't quite physical enough. Um, they're more dynamic this year. They play better defense, top to bottom. Um, they've added guys into the rotation like Trey Kaufman Wren, who, who match up and play differently and, and give you different looks than Zach Eady. Zach Eady is the two time national player of the year. So, so he's been a baseline for them to, to build around and, and sort of maintain who they are and what, and what matters to Painter in the program while acknowledging they had to switch some things up. And I think it's a, a pretty admirable. Uh, coaching job, both in the macro and in the micro, and you saw against Tennessee the way he's able to manage a game and, and get his guys through through these games where they didn't shoot the ball well at all. Frankly, they looked pretty nervous, but they're so good as a baseline now that that you they can get away with that in ways that they simply haven't been able to in the past few years. It also helps that Zach EDA stuck around and B has the ability to go 40-15, which he did on <laughs> yeah. Sunday. I mean, <sighs> this guy is also going to have a long NBA career if he stays healthy. Speaking of a dominant force, UConn, you know, the defending national champ. And I mean, the numbers on them are actually pretty ridiculous. So they have won their past 10 NCAA tournament games by at least 13 points. The first team to win by that many by double digits. They have trailed for only 28 seconds in this year's tournament and have beaten their four opponents by an average of nearly 28 points. Can you give me some context here, Eamon, to how dominant this team is? Like, what... What compares to this? What compares to what UConn is doing right now? Yeah, not a, not a whole lot. I mean, you, you have to stretch back to, you know, I, I think even, I don't think the, the Florida team that went back to back was like this, you know, I mean, they were really, really good. And I think they turned it on in the tournament in a way that a veteran team with NBA guys and a really good coach kind of could, but UConn has been remarkable. And I think you, you, Another big contrast with that Florida team or with past teams that that have repeated um, or come close to it even is that those teams had essentially the same rosters and were in a, a college hoops context where uh, it wasn't totally crazy to bring back. You know, if you had a, a team of really good sophomores, chances are they're going to come back and try and play together or, or at least give it a shot. Uh, this UConn team is totally different from the one that, that won last year's title. You know, the, the guard is the same, Tristan Newton at point guard, although he's much different a player than, than he was a year ago. Um, they lost two guys to the NBA who were their two best players last year. Sort of went out in the portal and got a guy like Cam Spencer. They developed sort of a spot freshman last year in Alex Caravan into a, a dominant wing sort of flex player. Donovan Klingon was not even a starter last year and is, is the best non Zach Eady center in the country. Dan Hurley has built a program where his assistants run the best stuff in the country and drop the best stuff in the country. The expectation for success is is constant. Sort of Hurley's manic drive to win fuels everything this program does, and, and you see it in the way they play. I mean, I thought the Illinois game was going to be a really good game. I went into that thinking, I think this could be a classic. Like, Illinois gets up and down. This is going to be fun. Terrence Shannon is so good. And, you know, UConn goes on a 30-0 run. And it's another embarrassing sort of easy win for them en route to a Final Four. They're on another level right now. And, and I think the craziest thing you can say about them is that this Purdue team has been, you know, they were my preseason number one. All along, I thought they were going to win the national title. They've lived up to any expectation and exceeded it. And go into this Final Four thinking they might not have a shot because UConn's so good. That's that's the level where where Hurley has taken this team. Are we all looking past Alabama? We've already kind of looked a little bit past North Carolina State, at least in sort of what makes sense. Does Alabama have a shot against UConn, or are we going to see more crazy, ridiculous stats from this game? I mean, the, the leads that UConn has had in the first round, 39 points against Stetson, 30 against Northwestern, 32 against San Diego State, and 31 against Illinois at some point in those games. The thing with Alabama is they can give anybody a game because they no team in college basketball makes the math work for them more. You know, totally under Nate Oates embraced the sort of uh, past decade of NBA analytically driven tactics, which involves spacing the floor at all times, playing a ton of pick and roll, having a point guard who can get downhill on pick and roll and spray the ball and shooting a ton of threes. And so they're a huge variance team 
because if they have an off night from three, that means they missed like 40 shots or whatever. You know, they're, 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 their off nights are really off, and they lost some some bad games along the way this season because of it. Uh, but when they're playing well and when they're cooking on the offensive end, I think that that sheer math gives them a chance to to play with anybody. I think on a pure matchup standpoint, they're going to have a hard time on the other end. Uh, even with a week to prepare, UConn runs an unbelievable bevy of sets, and they're tricky, and they run actions off of other actions. But Alabama has not been a good defensive team all year. Um, they have to score a ton to, to win this game. And, and maybe they can, maybe they do something crazy where they could go 18 or 36 from three. And again, the math just works for them, but it's going to be a, a tall, tall task. All right. So for more insight to the final four in the men's tournament, please check out Eamon's great newsletter buzzer at, I'm going to spell it again. So people get it. It's uh E A M O N N B R E N N A N.com. That's right. Again, Eamon, I got that great. Yeah, that's right. You nailed it. All right, folks, please check that out. Uh, Eamon, man, thanks so much for joining us, and we can't wait to have you on again, okay? Thanks for having me. It was great, and uh, enjoy the rest of the tournament. And in the next segment, we'll bring on Kent Babb of the Washington Post to talk about his story on LSU women's basketball coach Kim Mulkey. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now, getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. At Bet365, we don't do ordinary. We believe that every sport should be epic. Every home run, every hit, every inning, every play. From the moments that are legendary to the ones that fly under the radar. Whether it's a walk-off, grand slam, or a base hit to center field. Whatever the sport, whatever the moment. It's never ordinary at Bet365. 21 plus only must be physically located in Virginia. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Ten days ago, LSU women's basketball coach Kim Mulkey attacked a Washington Post profile of her that hadn't been published. Mulkey called the story a hit piece, claimed that the reporter tried to trick her former coaches into believing that she was cooperating with him on the story and offered former players anonymity in exchange for negative quotes about her. Mulkey offered no evidence for any of her allegations, and the long-form story by Post Sports features writer Kent Babb was published over the weekend. Headlined The Kim Mulkey Way, the nearly 7,000-word profile explores the complicated and consistently controversial past and present of one of the most successful coaches in American sports. Mulkey isn't your grandmother or your mascot, Bab writes, and while everyone else is fighting for women's basketball, she's fighting against something, because it's the fight that drives her, even if you played for her, won for her, loved her. Kent Babb joins us now. Kent, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, guys, for having me. Whatever Kim Mulkey was trying to preemptively quash, Kent, I thought you wrote a traditional, detailed, careful, deeply reported magazine profile full of insight into what shaped and what defines a high-profile sports figure. What was your goal when you decided to profile Kim Mulkey? Well, initially, I wanted to find out how this little five foot four country raised Louisiana white lady can bond and motivate and draw the absolute best out of people who don't look like her, who did not grow up like her, 
who may not think like her or live like her, but somehow she's able to motivate them and win championships like no coach I've ever seen. It's just almost impossible for me to explain. So Kim and I actually met and spoke for 45 minutes in December 2021. I pitched her. We got along well. Uh, I thought she was into it. And then LSU uh, spiked it. And so from then on, you know, I sort of paid attention. Obviously, it was clear that she had some suspicions of myself and the Washington Post. But like I told her, you know, okay, yes, like I I live and work in Washington, D.C. and work for a media organization. But I also was born in rural South Carolina and grew up in South Carolina. So if there are two Americas, I've lived in them both. And I can see either perspective. And I think that was at least compelling to her. And, you know, so through last year, last season, when they won the national championship, you know, I just continued to be fascinated by this person, like more fascinated probably just by her ability to coach as well as she can, as as well as she does, but just kind of continue to invite this almost unbelievable controversy that she just never backs down from. And so when I revisited the story uh, during the season, it was sort of the same thing. And I wanted to figure out, especially once it was made clear that she was not going to speak with me, even in an off the record capacity, because I worked with the Washington Post, that I wanted to see why she was the way she is. And not just personally, but how she became so damn good, you know? Like, why is she so fiery? Why is she so, you know, suspicious of people? Why why does she, like, kind of build these walls around herself psychologically? And that's kind of what I went off in search of. Kent, I just want to make sure I clarify here in, in, in a follow-up. So her beef was with the Washington Post itself, like the media organization itself. That's what she was skeptical of? I assume so. In this case, I believe LSU was in favor of me writing a profile. Like they they were not happy with my Brian Kelly piece that's not even really a Brian Kelly piece from 2022. At the end of the day, they were upset at one of their members of the board, the Collis Temple, who was their who was the first black varsity athlete to ever play at LSU. I mean like they they blamed me for things that he said and I suppose they hoped that I would filter or censor whatever Collis Temple had told me. But that's not my job, obviously. But this go round, I think they wanted me to write kind of that deeply analytical story that kind of explored the the pros and cons of Kim Mulkey. And in this time, you know, she just wouldn't do it. And and I even got an email uh, from an LSU women's basketball spokesman that before her press conference was going to be in the story that said Coach Mulkey would deny any opportunity to speak with the Washington Post on or off the record. So that's not something that they or she shies away from. And, you know, that she had zero intention. She didn't care so much, I don't believe, in avoiding me. She wanted to avoid my employer. And, and I mean, that was reiterated even by that same spokesman when I visited Baton Rouge in early March. I even asked, I was like, was it me or is it the Post? And he said, it's the Post. Quick uh, other follow up. And I'm kind of surprised. And I don't know, Stefan, if you felt the same way. Uh, Kent, to know that you actually had a prior relationship with Kim Mulkey. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like the kind of relationship you had with how often you'd interacted with her and how would you characterize that relationship? It's, calling it a relationship is probably taking a little too far. Like, uh, I mean, I had I had one 45 minute off the record conversation with her. So, I mean, I can't get into the details of it. And, okay, you know, okay. just to say that we had a really good conversation. And I think, you know, Kim has always had this thing where, yeah, like there are some people who don't want to, you know, go near her, but they want to criticize. And like, so her code has almost always been, come down here, look me in the eye, and I'll tell you whatever you want. You may not like it, but if you kind of have the spine to come and look me in the face and deal with how I'm going to deal with you, bring it on. And that's kind of the way our first thing was. Like, I mean, I understand that. I mean, like, I've profiled Kobe Bryant, wrote a whole book about Allen Iverson. Like, I've this is not my first rodeo when it comes to controversial or volatile figures. And... 
I think she liked me. I really do. I mean, like we got along really well. Like there was a vibe there and, you know, we left it and she, she said, you know, something to the effect of like, yeah, let's just sort of see what happens. And, you know, organizationally, I think LSU just decided it wasn't worth it and they were upset. And and again, I understand on some level, I get it. I mean, it's politics, it's corporate politics, on, you know, at the end of the day. And in the two years since, I think LSU went one way uh, in terms of what they thought and realized like who they were actually upset with. And Kim, I think, decided, you know what, this just isn't worth it for me, which I don't necessarily disagree with. How much of that over the last two years, Kent, would you say had to do with your actual reporting? Did it become clear to them, LSU and Kim, that you were, in fact, doing what is, again, kind of a conventional, traditional piece of analytical profiling of a important subject, talking to family members, talking to former employers, talking to former employees, in this case, talking to players. How much of it was that? Because it's also, let's be clear, was not the first time that Kim Mulkey has been profiled or profiled critically for that matter. The critical ones are a bit rare. Um, and I will say that, you know, profiling someone like Kim Mulkey, honestly, not even critically, but honestly, is it's just something she seems very sensitive of. And I don't know why I don't, I mean, I didn't uncover or learn anything that gave me a whole lot of insight on why she's so defensive, except for, mm -hmm. you know, what she might have gone through as a young person with her parents and the things that you believe and part of your identity that you've put so much weight on just collapsing from out from under you at, at a particularly vulnerable time in your life. That's my only guess, my psychoanalytical guess, but that's all it is. But I mean, I didn't start even really reaching out to people within her circle, like in earnest until early March. Like I had paid attention to Kim and read her book and read Brittany's book and sort of read articles going back to the beginning of the Kim Mulkey story. So like 1980, but I didn't really hit the gas on reporting until like March 10th. So I didn't reach out to the family. Honestly, like I don't believe anybody had anything to be sensitive about until long after I started reporting. And to be honest with you, one of the things I really struggled with was getting people to tell me why Kim Mulkey's so great. You know, people are so sensitive and careful. And I believe it's in an attempt to protect her because those who do believe in her really believe in her. And I encountered a similar dynamic with Alan Iverson. Like if you're in a circle, you don't do anything to mess with that. Like you've got his back and you will fight anybody who like is coming after him. But like the downside of it is I need you to tell me why you love this person. Like I need you to tell me why you would run through a hundred brick walls for him. And that's really the hardest thing I had to try to get. Like nobody wanted to talk to me ostensibly because they want to protect her and they didn't know me. And I get that. But like at the same time, like I, I needed them to tell me why she's so amazing, not why she's not, you know, somebody that they feel comfortable with personally. Before we get into some of the meat of the profile and what you did learn, Ken, I do want to give you an opportunity to sort of respond, if you can, to what Mulkey said in that press conference, these allegations about how you did your reporting, um, that you tried to trick people, that you offered some sort of quid pro quo for negative quotes. I've known you a long time. I have read your work. Full disclosure, I blurbed one of your books. You're a great reporter and writer. Do you feel the need to respond to what she said? And if so... I mean, just like a lot of the things that she said and accused me of doing are just flat, not true. I mean, that's just not how I do my job. And, you know, I don't expect people who feel like I was unfair to Kim or Kim to believe that, but I know what's true. And whatever I say or Kim says or everyone in between doesn't change what's true. And I went back and checked to see if I worded something questionably or might have gone too far in suggesting that I was with Kim. I didn't. It's just not true. Yes, I said I was in Baton Rouge. With Kim never appears in my texts, my emails. I don't need to trick people. 
I have a code and I've lived by it my entire career. I never, ever, ever lie, ever. Even if it's going to screw me over professionally or keep me from getting an interview or a perspective that I really think I need, I just never, ever, ever lie. And it's just one of those things that I, I live and work by and I'll never change that because I just, I don't believe in it. And I'll challenge anybody to find a situation where I did. So, Ken, since you're in the the challenging mood, (laughs) another criticism that I've seen bandied about that I don't agree with, for the record, but I just kind of want to give you a chance to address it, is the idea that reaching out to her family members was, I guess, you know, for lack of a better term, beyond the pale. That, you know, that that's too intrusive into her life. And, I, you know, I reject that criticism because so much of the work, my favorite work that I've done for myself is reaching out to people's families not necessarily with their permission. So I'm just sort of curious how you handle that and how did you make contact with the father and the sister and uh, and go from there? Yeah, I mean, while I was in Baton Rouge, I just cold called a lot of people and to see who wanted to talk. I honestly didn't think that the sister or the father would have anything to say to me. I guess like generally, I don't buy that a pretty famous public figure who is one of the highest paid people in the state of Louisiana and is the highest paid person in her profession doesn't think that a profile writer for the Washington Post is going to reach out to people who know her the best. And that's what my job is. Now, I will say, had she granted interviews with me, you know, maybe there's a little more give and take. But on a more, I guess, practical level, Her family and her father's infidelity is something that she has not only written about in her own memoir, but she's spoken about it a lot over the years. And she wears her response to these things as a badge of honor. I mean, the title of her memoir is Won't Back Down, and it's a collection of these instances where she felt wronged or betrayed or that her hyper-intense loyalty was not given back to her. And she just cut these people off. So I don't know. (laughs) Like, I mean, I think it's probably ripe for a debate topic, but I don't think that if you're super famous and you've also declined interview requests that you have a whole lot of a leg to stand on when I just start calling people who know you very well and they're adults and they want to talk and tell me something. I also reject the fact that The father was a sympathetic figure in the story. I think he's sad. And I also think there are things that other people can learn from that. And there are parallels. But, you know, if if people came away from that story thinking that the father is a sympathetic figure, then I didn't do my job as well as I thought I did. The connective thread through your story and through her autobiography, for that matter, is the way, as you already said, she cuts people out of her life who have wronged or betrayed or upset her, her father, and more recently, her sister, who's the lead of the story, former players, former coaches, the athletic director at Louisiana Tech, where she played basketball and later worked. That's the thread here. And the new material in this piece, Kent, and I would like you to talk about some of that, does involve uh, some of her players, Kelly Griffin for one and Emily Neiman for another. Can you tell us about what you found, what you learned from talking to those players and how it reflects on Kim Mulkey, the person? Yeah, I mean, Emily and Kelly in particular, I just want to say are incredibly brave because not only were they willing to use their names and their experiences on the record, they did so knowing that there would be possibly negative repercussions. I mean, Emily, I think, has been blackballed from basketball. I mean, she's coaching and really wants to be a college basketball coach, but she can't get a job because if you go sideways of Kim Mulkey, even if you kind of own the fact that it was less Kim than it was you at age 21 or whatever, it just doesn't matter. I mean, like, there's this kind of like, this is a world where, you know, if you're dead, you're dead. You know, there's no coming back. And Kim, I think, is is a particularly extreme case of this where, you know, she just deletes people from her life who did not return her loyalty. And loyalty is clearly the most important thing to her. Um, and her, her interpretation of loyalty, I should say. And the fact that these two women 
shared their story, knowing that they may get attacked, knowing that it may deepen, you know, what Kim and the Baylor family may think of them. And they just did it unbowed. You know, I, it couldn't have impressed me more. And in both of these cases, Kent, to be clear, both players kind of complained, complained to you on the record, as you said, about Mulkey's response to their sexuality and whether they should stay on the team and icing them out of her life entirely. In the case of Emily Neiman, you write how there's a player who hit five three-pointers in Baylor's 2005 championship game to cap an undefeated season and had this falling out with her and 10 years later comes back hoping to restore the relationship and Mulkey just won't talk to her. And in Griffin's case, same thing. A woman who had come out in high school whose sexuality became an issue while she was at Baylor and who ended up transferring out of the program after some allegation of a fight um, and some other other issues inside the team. Yeah, and my takeaway is often it was less about sexuality than identity, just sort of general identity, how you present yourself, what you wear, what you say, Hmm. what ink you may have. And, you know, I believe that Kim thought that she was helping these people, you know, particularly at at the world's largest Baptist university, Baylor. I don't believe these young women thought that all the time. And there was kind of a lack of a willingness to hold a conversation and have an understanding with perspectives that were different than Kim's own. I mean, there is a pattern that if you're different and look different than Kim, she blanches at that. And like, she may call you out on it. Now, is that good coaching to turn the emotional screws and get the absolute best out of you, even if you're pissed off at her? Or is it toxic? I don't know. I can't answer that. But it depends on who you ask, because there are people who will go to the wall on either side of those arguments and say, yeah, I don't care. She drew the absolute best out of me because of this. And there are other people who say, yeah, she went too far. So, you know, Kent, as I read your story, I kept thinking a little bit about a few coaches like Bill Parcells, Bob Knight, the image of the sort of perpetually angry coach who ends up estranged from the people and the players and coaches who were along for their ride to the top. And it seems sort of sad to me. You said people wouldn't even tell you what made her a great coach. So I'm just sort of curious, of all the people you talked to, now you've had a chance to sort of think about it, what do you think about her Like as she sort of ends her career here? It doesn't seem like there's a lot of warmth or fondness for her. Like There's a lot of respect and a lot of regard for what she's done, but like it just doesn't seem like there's a lot of warmth and that there's a lot of people that are you know close to her uh, in that way. Joel, I I think that she's somebody who's sort of caught between generations and the people that you named, Parcells, Bob Knight, you know, people like that who just like drove people absolutely to their max in in coach in that kind of traditional hard-nosed way. I don't know if we're going to see a whole lot more of that, you know, kind of moving forward as players have a lot more agency and power and earning potential even in college. I don't think you're going to be able to brutalize players the way that used to be done. On the other side, you know, Kim is 61. I don't see her adopting, you know, kind of a new school approach of like, man, like players are peers, the Mike McDaniel at Miami Dolphins way. And so she's sort of caught in between. And I think that's awkward. And I'm sure it's hard. Uh, She's awesome, though, at what she does. And like, so she's won a national championship, is competing for another one. And That's sort of my takeaway is she's a little bit older than the new school will allow, but she's too young to sort of be one of those traditional hard asses that was just like, oh, this is the way I did it. And I think that's interesting. Like, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's it's really interesting and fascinating to me that she's sort of right caught in between these two dominant generational eras in college sports in particular, and she keeps on winning no matter what. And keeps on attracting players who talk about how much they love and respect her as a coach. And cut down the nets with her. 
Kent Babb is a sports features writer for the Washington Post. We'll post a link to his story, The Kim Mulkey Way, on our show page. Kent, thank you so much for joining us on the show. All right, fellas. Thank you again. I appreciate it very much. Can you set the stage a little bit so people understand what happened? In 1969, 14 black student athletes were kicked off their university's American football team for planning a show of support against racism. We were really protesting our treatment on the field. Amazing Sports Stories from the BBC World Service tells their story. We became brothers that day when he did that to us. We made a change. Fighting for what we deserve. Search for Amazing Sports Stories wherever you get your BBC podcasts. Now it is time for After Balls, sponsored by Bennett's Prune Juice, endorsed by Kenny Sailors, who says, that was okay. So March Madness is a brand name meant to be applied exclusively to the NCAA Division I men's basketball tournament. But that does not mean that D1 has a monopoly on all of the madness of college basketball in March. In fact, it could be that no level of college basketball will have an end anywhere near as mad as the final seconds of the Division II championship on Saturday. Minnesota State and Nova Southeastern were tied at 85 in the final seconds of the game. Here's what happened next. Final seconds, tie game, national championship, Malik, this is Kyrie. Oh, he hit it, point six. Point six seconds. So what you heard there was the sound of Kyrie Willingham nailing a corner three to give Minnesota State an 88-85 lead that would ultimately prove to be the final score. The assist on that go-ahead basket? was credited to Malik Willingham, Kyrie's older brother. The Willingham brothers each finished with 12 points in the championship victory, the first D2 title for Minnesota State. And look, the Mavericks won a day after their women's team also won the Division II championship, beating Texas Women's University, my mother's alma mater, 89-73 to in the final on Friday. Minnesota became just the third school in any division to win both the men's and women's championships in the same season. The other two, Connecticut, which accomplished the feat twice at the Division I level, doing so in 2004 and 2014, and Central Missouri State, which won both D2 titles in 1984. So 40 years later, here we go. Minnesota State takes over. So a little background on the school itself. It's actually called Minnesota State University Mankato, and it's the second biggest school in the state after the flagship in Minneapolis. Among its famous alumni are current Governor Tim Walls and Carolina Panthers receiver Adam Thielen. The school mascot is Stomper the Maverick, a caricature of a wild steer, which sounds perfect for an afterball name, Stomper the Maverick. So, Stefan, congrats to the Mavericks, men and women of Minnesota State. No place seems better suited to celebrate the end of March Madness. So, Stefan, what is your Stomper the Maverick? A couple of weeks ago, a friend of the show relayed to us that a friend of his, the pioneering trans tennis player from the 1970s, Renee Richards, had relayed to him that a pioneering woman chess player from the 1960s had died. Richards was friends with the player, Lisa Lane, and she was surprised that no one had written about her death in late February. So, at Josh's suggestion, I did. In the early 60s, Lane had a brief but furious run of celebrity. Every story about her focused on three things, her gender, her age, and her looks, and how those facts made her success in a brainiac sport so unlikely. Lane's backstory was catnip. She didn't start playing chess until she was in college and won the U.S. Women's Championship just two and a half years later, in late 1959, when she told reporters she was just 21 years old. That turned out to be not true. She was actually 26, a fact that went unreported until, well, I reported it in Slate. After her U.S. title, Lane went on the Today Show. In 1960, a journalist named Neil Hickey wrote one of the first leering profiles of her for a Sunday newspaper supplement, The American Weekly. 
She has all the equipment, all the lissom beauty of a cover girl, Hickey wrote. This curvaceous campaigner, he said, will beat you fair and square or rattle your composure with a flutter of eyelids. Hickey and Lane started dating a year later and remained together for more than 60 years. Lane appeared on the game shows to tell the truth and what's my line, stumping a panel of celebrities about who she was. In June 1961, our friend Robert Lipsight profiled her in the New York Times Magazine. When I came across Lipsight's story, I immediately called him. I noted that his piece also was pretty cringy. A comely, shapely Philadelphia girl, he wrote, who would never run her hand through her hair without the approval of Elizabeth Arden. And we discussed the casual sexism of the time, about the way male reporters covered women athletes. Lipsight remembered the Times sports editors sending him, a 22-year-old night rewrite kid, to interview Olympic champion Wilma Rudolph in a reception area at the newspaper. That's what we thought of women athletes, he said. But Lipsight's piece treated Lane with much more respect than others, and he got great stuff out of her. He visited her radio, TV, and phonographless apartment and counted the number of chess books on her shelf, 73. Lane proclaimed herself to him the most important American chess player because of how her looks, youth, and talent were attracting publicity and money to the game. She talked about and didn't apologize for her volatile temper over the board. She mocked the young and rude Bobby Fischer, and she dissed the sexist male chess players who sent her love letters. Two months later, on August 7th, 1961, Lane was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. It's one of the magazine's iconic no-frills cover shots. Lane, in a yellow blouse with a big black coif, bangs dangling on her forehead, looking straight at the camera over her left shoulder against a plain blue background, a few chess pieces in the foreground. And the headline, U.S. Chess Champion Lisa Lane. The accompanying story was by Robert Cantwell, a novelist, critic, biographer, reporter, and intellectual who wrote for the magazine about birding, polo, llamas, bike paths, and free road maps. Seven months before profiling Lane, Cantwell profiled 17-year-old Bobby Fischer, whom he'd write about again when Fischer became the second chess player to appear on SI's cover in 1972. Cantwell's piece about Lane is typically icky. Where in the history of this ancient sport, or in what other activity for that matter, have brains and beauty and personality been so intriguingly combined, it concluded. But it filled in the gaps in Lane's turbulent childhood and traced the narrative of her stunning rise in chess and the challenges she faced in trying to become a world champion. It's a classic early SI bonus, as the magazine's features were known, long, detailed, writerly. Lane goes from telling Cantwell she doesn't want to talk about her childhood to telling him everything, including how her life changed when she accidentally struck and killed a woman with a car. Lisa Lane would win one more U.S. title in 1966, but she wouldn't become a world champion. She walked away from chess in 1967, married Hickey in 1969, and spent most of her time in rural Putnam County, New York, where she opened a natural food store and later a gift shop that sold gems and minerals. In 1971, Lane defeated an early computer program at IBM. After that, she rarely talked about or played chess. Sports Illustrated's Emma Bacheleri found her for a story in 2018. Lane was inducted into the U.S. Chess Hall of Fame in 2023. She died of cancer and was actually 90. Wow, man. What a life. That's a crazy story, man. I love, you know, these period pieces, just reading about and learning about sports and America in the 60s is never uninteresting, Joel. Can you just imagine meeting this person, you know, a decade ago, meeting Lisa Lane a decade ago, and they just have just receded into, you know, retirement? I I just wonder how many people Lisa Lane was around every day that just had no clue about this part of her life, you know? Yeah. Oh, she wouldn't talk about it, apparently. Um, I spoke for the obit I wrote for Slate with her widower, uh, Neil Hickey, whom I mentioned, journalist, had a long career, TV Guide bureau chief when TV Guide was the best-selling magazine in America. He went to Vietnam, Cuba, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, Northern Ireland, all over the world to write about how television 
covered crises. He was an author, an adjunct professor at Columbia. So Hick, when I was talking to him, I came across this discrepancy in her age because I was fact checking and I said to him, she was 85 when she died, right? Because that's what it said in her wiki. And he said, no, no, she was 90. <laughs> and I was like, what? And I said to him, I wanted to be sure. So I, I asked him if he could double check her birth date against, I don't oh, know, her driver's gosh, license. Funny. And Hickey said, she hadn't, she hadn't driven in years, but I think I know where it is. And I could hear him mm. walking upstairs. He found it in a drawer and he said it was April 25th, 1933. So she was in mm. fact 90. The saddest coda here though, Joel, is that I talked to Neil Hickey multiple times um, a couple weeks ago. The last was on a Wednesday in the morning. The Slate story published on Wednesday afternoon. He thanked me for being a careful reporter. He invited me to visit. And the next day, I am sad to say, Neil Hickey had a heart attack at oh. home and died less than a month oh. after his wife. Uh, he was He was 92. That's that's I tough, know, but right? uh, you know I don't know how people tend to think of these things. You just hope that they found each other again. I mean, that's the way to think of it. Yeah, and lives well lived, right? I mean, accomplished journalist and author, and this woman who was a pioneer. They did what they were supposed to do, man. So yeah, good for them. But uh, yeah, that's th thanks for doing that, man. I'm glad to learn a little bit about that today. That is our show for today. Our producer is Kevin Bendis. To listen to past shows and subscribe or just reach out, go to slate.com slash hangup. And you can email us at hangup at slate.com. Please subscribe to the show and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And please tune in on Tuesday for our special Slate Plus Emergency Bonus Elite Eight Women's Basketball episode with me, Joel, and Josh Levine. For Joel Anderson, I'm Stefan Fatsis. Remember Zelmo Beatty and Lisa Lane, and thanks for listening. At Bed 365, we don't do ordinary. We believe that every sport should be epic. Every home run, every hit, every inning, every play. From the moments that are legendary to the ones that fly under the radar. Whether it's a walk-off, grand slam, or a base hit to center field. Whatever the sport, whatever the moment. It's never ordinary at Bet365. 21 plus only must be physically located in Virginia. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER.